mindfulness of breathing, keeping the breath in mind, is the meditation theme that the Buddha taught more than any other. And he praised it highly. He said it can take you all the way to clear knowledge and release, the knowledge of awakening, release from all suffering and stress. It's the meditation that he taught in most detail. And you can think of it as your home as a meditator. You may need to go foraging out in other areas, having other themes for dealing with specific problems that come up in the mind. But it's good to have the breath as home base, the place you come back to. There was one time when the Buddha was talking about how important breath meditation was, and one of the monks said, well, I practice breath meditation. And the Buddha asked him, what kind of breath meditation do you practice? And the monk said, I put aside thoughts of the past, don't hanker after thoughts of the future, and try to keep the mind at equanimity in the present as I breathe in, breathe out. And the Buddha said, well, there is that kind of breath meditation, but it's not the most beneficial, not the most productive. And then he went on to teach breath meditation in 16 steps. So it's good to know the steps, because these are the most effective ways of making the breath into your home base. The first four focus primarily on the body. You're aware of the breath when it's long, you're aware of the breath when it's short. And you can expand on this to notice other variations in your breathing. Notice when it's heavy, notice when it's light. deep or shallow. Notice whether it's comfortable or not. Then the Buddha says, try to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in. Be aware of the whole body as you breathe out. This requires some training. You have to learn how to expand your sense of awareness and keep it expanded throughout the body, at the same time without losing focus. So you might want to practice going through the body section by section, noticing how the sensation of breathing feels in different parts of the body. How does it feel in your abdomen? How does it feel in your chest? How does it feel in your head? How does it feel in your back, in your shoulders, in your arms, in your legs? Because breathing is a whole body process. We think of it primarily as the air coming in and out of the lungs. But there's an energy flow that goes throughout the entire body, each time you breathe in, each time you breathe out. And so you want to be aware of it in the different parts of the body to make sure that it's comfortable in each part and that the different parts are working together and not at cross purposes. So make a survey throughout the different parts of the body to familiarize yourself with how the breathing feels. That right there is a project you can do for a whole hour. You can do it for many days to get more and more sensitive to the breathing. And think of it as a way of showing goodwill for yourself and goodwill for other people. Goodwill in the sense that you're learning how to breathe comfortably. You learn how to create a sense of well-being that doesn't have to depend on things outside. It just feels good breathing in, feels good breathing out. And when the breathing feels good, you're going to be much less irritable, much less likely to feel oppressed by the situations around you. So even when things go badly outside, you don't feel like they're weighing in on you, because you've got your own space right here that you can still breathe in comfortably, breathe out comfortably. And it's an act of kindness for others as well, because when you're coming from a comfortable spot here, a comfortable sensation in the body, you're less likely to act on greed or aversion or delusion or any of the other ways of being unskillful with others. So people will suffer less from your defilements.
This is an essential principle throughout the Buddhist teachings, that if you look after, care for your mind really well, you're not the only person who benefits. The image the Buddha gives is of two acrobats. The story goes that an acrobat, who was the teacher, said to his assistant, Okay, you get up on my shoulders, and we'll get up on the top of the bamboo pole, and you look out after me, and I'll look out after you, and that way we'll come down safely. And his assistant said, No, that's not going to work at all. You look out after yourself, I'll look out after myself, and that way we help one another to come down safely. In other words, you look out after your balance, because you can't really look out for other people's balance. The best way you can help them is to look out after your balance and make sure you don't knock, knock them off balance. So in helping yourself, you're helping others. This is true for all the Buddhist teachings. When you're generous, you're helping yourself, you're helping others. When you're virtuous, you help yourself and you help others. You spread thoughts of goodwill, you help yourself, you help others. You meditate in other ways. You're helping yourself and you're helping others. And this way it blurs the line between who's helping whom, or who's going to benefit from your practice. It's not that you're the only person benefiting when you're meditating. In the same way that when you're generous with other people, it's not that they're the only people who are benefiting. You're benefiting as well. The Buddha teaches a form of happiness that doesn't have boundaries. So as you look after the breath, throughout the different parts of the body, as the Buddha said, you try to train yourself to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, the whole body as you breathe out, and then you try to calm the breathing. This doesn't mean that you stifle it or you stop it. It means you allow the breath to go gentle. So in any places where the breath feels harsh, you think of it just getting lighter. One way you can do this is think of the breath energy coming in and out of the body through every pore. So it requires less effort on your part to breathe in, to breathe out. That's the first set. The first four steps in breath meditation, being aware of the short breathing, long breathing, training yourself to be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, the whole body as you breathe out, and then train yourself to allow the breath to grow calm as you breathe in, breathe out, so it feels gentle and soothing. Now the next four steps have to do with feelings. First you train yourself to breathe in and out, sensitive to rapture. The word rapture here can also mean refreshment. Ask yourself, what kind of breathing would feel refreshing right now? Because feelings don't simply come and go on their own. The mind helps to fabricate them. In other words, there's an intentional element in every feeling. So ask yourself, how can I breathe in a way that would feel refreshing, that would feel full throughout the body? Full as you breathe in, full even as you breathe out. The next step would be to breathe in and out in a way that feels easeful, feels pleasant. The difference between refreshment and pleasure is refreshment is like coming across a glass of water after you've been out in the desert. It's a very intense and energetic pleasure, whereas the ease that you want to develop in the next step is cooler, gentler. And the Buddha tells you to breathe in and out, sensitive to what he calls mental fabrication, to see how the feelings in the breath have an effect on your mind. and see how your perceptions have an effect on the mind as well. You know, the perceptions, these are the labels you apply to things. For instance, the labels you apply to the breath. What kind of mental image do you have of the breathing? If you think of the body as a big bellows that you have to pull the breath in, push the breath out, that's going to make the breath coarse. It's not going to be so easeful and soothing for the mind. But if you think of the body as a large sponge, when you breathe in, there are all these holes that the breath can come in and go out. And just holding that perception in mind makes the breathing process easier, 
It's a more easeful perception to hold in your mind. It has a more calming effect on the mind. Or if you find that your breathing is laborious, you can think of the breath energy coming in and out of the forehead, down from the top of the head, in through your eyes, in through your ears, in from the back of the neck, going down your back, in at your throat, going down through the chest. Just hold those images in mind and see what impact it has on the breathing and on your mind. And the next step, the Buddha says, try to find the perception and feeling that's most easeful, that's calming to the mind. So if you find that the spun's perception is more calming, you hold on to that. If you find it's more easeful to think of the breath coming down from the top of the head, in and out the palms of your hands, the soles of your feet, there's lots of different perceptions you can play with. You try to find the ones that are most easeful. Those are the four steps that deal with feeling. The next four steps deal with the mind. You want to be aware of, to begin with, just the state of your mind. As you breathe in, the state of your mind as you breathe out. And then you want to notice if it's in balance or out of balance. If it's out of balance, there are different ways you can deal with it. If the mind is feeling depressed, sluggish, stale, ask yourself, how could you breathe in, how could you breathe out in a way that would be gladdening to the mind? Well, this is where you can branch out and use other topics of meditation. You can think about the Buddha, see if that gives a sense of gladness. You can think about the Dharma, the Sangha, see if that gives a sense of gladness. You can think about the times you've been virtuous or generous in the past, see if that's encouraging. In other words, any dharma topic that helps to gladden the mind, you can bring that in and use it. Or you can, again, you can work with the breath. What kind of breathing would give energy to the mind, give refreshment to the mind? That's if the mind is feeling sluggish or stale. On, their hand, if, on the other hand, if the mind is feeling scattered, restless, okay, what kind of breathing could steady it? or what meditation topics could steady it. Here you might find if you're feeling lazy, don't really want to meditate, you can have the reflections on death, or those five reflections we chanted just now, re remembering that you're subject to aging, illness, and death, and separation. The only thing you really can hold on to are your actions. Where do your actions come from? They come from the mind. And if your mind isn't trained, what's uh, going to do. It's going to do a lot of unskillful things. So the best way to prepare for aging, illness, and death is to train the mind. And that can have a riveting effect on the mind. We can do the contemplation that the Buddha recommends every morning at dawn. You just see the sunrise. You remind yourself, this could be your last sunrise. Are you ready to go? And the usual answer is no. Well, why not? Changes need to be made in the mind so that you would be ready to go. Because very few people know at sunrise that this is going to be their last day. Then you don't want to be heedless. You don't want to be caught off guard. So that's an encouragement to practice. Focuses the mind. And then again, at sunset, he said, this could be your last sunset. You might die at night. Are you ready to go? And if the answer is no, okay, you've got work to do, and you know what work you've got to do. You need to train the mind, at the very least, to get, get it more steady, more resilient. Let go of all of its foolish attachments. That requires work. You need training. And then if the mind is feeling burdened, 
and figure out how to release it from its burdens, particularly if it's being burdened with unskillful thinking. It might be thoughts of sensuality, thoughts of anger. How can you let go of those? Sometimes you look at the object. If it's an object that excites desire, you look at the side that it's not so desirable. This is why we have the contemplation of the body. The body may look pretty on the surface, but if you took off the skin, you couldn't look at it at all. You'd run away. And yet why is it with just that little film of skin it's attractive? What's the mind doing to itself? What games is it playing with itself? So it focuses on the, only the things that seem attractive and blots out everything else. Similarly with anger. When you're feeling angry at somebody, all you can do is focus on their unattractive side, the unappealing side, the unpleasant side. Then you can work yourself up into a real fury. But are you really being fair? Are you being fair to the other person or are you being fair to yourself? After all, who's suffering from your anger? You're certainly suffering from it right now. So if you find that the mind is being burdened by things like this, you find ways of unburdening it. And the Buddha takes this even deeper at even the subtle levels of concentration. Each level has a certain element of stress. It's very subtle, but it's there. If the mind gets focused on a level of concentration, sit with it for a while so you get to know it really well. Do you recognize what's really going on in this state of concentration? Because when you first hit it, oftentimes you don't really see the whole thing. You see that it seems less stressful than you were before. You don't see any stress in this concentration at all. But you have to get familiar with it so you can begin to see, oh, there still is this little bit of inconstancy. There's still a little bit of wavering in, this, in the concentration. With this certain mental activities which are a little bit burdensome. Not much, but enough so that you can notice it. When you notice that, then you drop them. That's the last of the steps dealing with the mind. But it moves you right into the last four steps, which have to do with what they call dhammas, or mental qualities. The first is learning how to look at inconstancy. Sometimes this is translated as impermanence, but the, the issue is not so much that things are impermanent, it's just that they keep changing. You think about that mountain over there, and the mountain's impermanent. You say, well, at least it's solid enough for me. But if you apply that perception to the things that you depend on for your happiness, and if there's even the slightest bit of change in those things, it's threatening. That's what the Buddha is pointing to. There's so many things in life that we pin our happiness on, pin our hopes on, that you have to look at them. Are they really dependable? They, can, they change right before your eyes. Even the state of concentration, which in the beginning seems so solid, after a while you begin to see it too has some wavering. It too has some ups and downs. And so the question is, what's causing that? What is the mind doing that's creating that rise and fall in the level of stress? This is where you begin to get into the Four Noble Truths. As the Buddha said, each truth has a duty. The duty with regard to stress is to comprehend it. It means watching it carefully so you can see exactly what it is, and particularly so you can see what it's coming from. This is why watching in constancy is an important part of seeing stress, because it allows you to see that the level of stress will go up and go down. That means that certain things are happening in the mind that cause it to go up, and other things are happening that cause it to go down. Well, what are those things? What are your perceptions? This is why the Buddha has you get sensitive to mental fabrication. What are the feelings? What are the perceptions that you apply, say, to pleasure or that you apply to pain? And how do they increase or decrease the level of stress in the mind? If you see that they cause an increase, drop them. 
because that's the duty with regard to the cause of stress, is to abandon it, to let it go. You do this by developing the path, which we've been doing all the way through with all these steps of meditation. So you can realize that when stress abandons with a dispassion, because that's why we're looking at inconstancy, is to get a sense of dispassion for the things that we're attached to. You really have to understand what attachment is all about. You're attached to things because they give pleasure. And many times you admit, well, it's not constant and it takes some effort, but it seems that the effort is worth it, that you get more pleasure, or at least enough pleasure to make the effort worth it. But what the Buddha wants you to look at is to see that the effort is not worth it at all. That the effort, the drawbacks of that particular pleasure are much greater than the actual pleasure you get from it. Because the mind tends to delude itself. It sees its pleasures as wonderful. It paints them up. It dresses them up. It elaborates on them. So they seem much more wonderful than they actually are. So he wants you to really look at it. What is the gratification you get out of that pleasure? And what are the drawbacks of that pleasure? It's in making this kind of analysis that, you, analysis that you actually let go of things. If you simply see them as empty, as changing in line with conditions, you can drop them temporarily, but they come back. Because there's still part of the mind that says, well, even if they're changing with conditions, the pleasure I get out of it is worth it. That's what you have to look into. Where is the pleasure here? Where is the effort? What's the pain and stress of the effort? Are they a good deal or are they a bad deal? That's what it comes down to. And what, but as you look at this, until you develop a sense of dispassion, that's the next step. Because it's through passion that we get involved with things to begin with, that we get attached to them. We create these things. As the Buddha said, your experience of form, feeling, perception, fabrication, and consciousness, there's an intentional element in all of this. A thought arises in the mind and you get involved. A feeling arises and you elaborate on it. A perception arises and either you go with it or you don't. But there's a choice that's made there. Sometimes the arising of these things comes from past karma, but then it's up to you to decide whether you want to go with them or not. It's like somebody driving up in a car. It's like, hey, jump in. Let's go. And you actually have the choice to jump in or not jump in. And if you're wise, you're going to ask, well, where are we going? What's going to happen if I jump in? Because it turns out that is, this is not going to be a free ride. You're going to have to pay for the gas. So is it worth it? It may actually have to force you to pedal the car. It turns out to be a pedal car. Is it worth it? When you see that it's not worth it, you develop a sense of dispassion. And when the dispassion comes, then these things will stop, because the, what keeps them going is your passion. So you watch things ceasing, ceasing because of dispassion. And then the final step of breath meditation, as the Buddha says, is relinquishment. You give up everything. Even the path at that point gets abandoned, because you don't need it anymore. It's like having a set of tools. As long as you have to work with the tools, you take good care of them, you look after them. But there comes a point where you, the job is done, where you let even the tools go. In other words, all your attachment even to the path gets abandoned at that point as well, as you breathe in, as you breathe out. So this is the kind of breath meditation the Buddha says that gives great rewards, it develops the four establishings of mindfulness, it develops all the factors of awakening, because you're developing mindfulness and keeping the breath in mind. As you analyze how you're doing this practice, skillfully or unskillfully, that develops the analysis of qualities. You try to do the best to develop what's skillful and abandon what's not. That's your persistence or energy or effort. And as you do it skillfully, there's a sense of refreshment or ease that comes. 
That's the rapture and the serenity factor of awakening. You develop concentration and the ability to watch all these things as they're happening. That's equanimity. You have all these seven together. Those are the qualities you need in order to develop the mind to awakening. Those are all being developed by these sixteen steps. As the Buddha said, they lead to release and knowledge. The knowledge of awakening, understanding what's the mind been doing that's been causing stress, how it can let go of the cause. In other words, you've completed all the duties with regard to the Four Noble Truths, the mind is released. No longer creates any unnecessary burdens for itself. It tastes the deathless. So this is what breath meditation can do. It's not just a preliminary exercise. It's the path that can take you all the way. Now you can augment it with other practices, as I've said, when the mind needs gladdening or when the mind needs steadying. When you find that you're stuck with an unskillful mental, mental qualities, you can use other techniques to pry the mind free from them. But the breath is where you always come back. It's your home. Because it's right here. It's where the body and the mind meet. The ideal place to watch both what's going on in the body and what's going on in the mind. So you can begin to see things as they actually are, to see where you're causing unnecessary suffering and stress. You see that it is actually unnecessary. There are these choices you're making as you fabricate your experience out of the raw materials that come from past actions. Then you learn how you can do it more and more skillfully to the point where there's really nothing more to do. At that point, the mind lets go. So whatever other meditation you do, make sure at the very least that you've got your home base covered. As the Buddha said, when you get involved in other meditation topics, sometimes unskillful states can arise, in which cases it always come back to the breath. He compared it to the beginning of the rainy season in India. He said during the hot season everything is dry and there's lots and lots of dust in the air. But when those first rains come through, they just wash all the dust out of the air and make the air very clean and clear and refreshing. In the same way with breath meditation, when you do it right, it can refresh the mind, clear the mind, wash the dust out of the mind. So give time to this skill, because it is the most basic skill in training the mind. It's your foundation. You want to make sure the foundation is strong. If you try to build a building with a weak foundation, it's going to fall over. No matter how beautiful the building may be, it's going to fall. But if the foundation is strong, then you can build as many stories as you like, and you don't have to worry about them falling down at all.